Yeah, Lewin does. Otherwise, uh, so the chat is open and questions can be typed in about this session. So otherwise, I can answer them for us. Otherwise, are you there? Yeah, I'm just uh, fixing my uh, speakers. I think it's because of, yeah. Kaya, could you speak up again? I just want to check. Yeah, can... so we'll, we'll begin the question and answer if you're ready. Yes, yes. Okay. So the chat is open and we're waiting for questions. So while people are typing their questions, I will offer a comment and a thought. There's so much, I don't think we'll be able to discuss everything which was in the session today. Um, you know, it's, there's every time you, we, we do this topic, there's always something new to learn. And today in particular, you had one slide up where you had um, about shaitan is locked in, in during Shabai Qadr. And there's a hadith from Bukhari which said that with the commencement of Ramadan, the doors to Jannat are opened, the doors to hell are closed, and the shaitan gets locked in chains. And that was part of your presentation that how do we understand this? Because we don't see this in a physical sense. And I was thinking about it that, uh, you know, with Ramadan, there's different tawils of it. And for some of the listeners who have been attending different sessions or have been reading the material, they might come across this idea that in our literature, that Imam Ali, one of, it, one of Imam Ali's titles or name or a code name was Ramadan. And that also for those who are familiar with the Hudud al Din structure, especially the 12 ranks of Hudud al Din, they would know that the rank of Asas, which comes um, after the Natik, the successor to the Natik, who was Imam Ali, is the ninth rank on that Hadud al Din, as well as Ramadan being the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. So, which means that, again, we have the idea that the Asas is nine, Imam Ali has nine, and Ramadan. Now, the function of the Asas, as we know, was to do the Tawil of the Quran. That was his function, whereas the Natik give the Tanzil, Imam Ali gives the Tawil, which clarifies all those matters that we could not understand in the Tanzili form, the Tawil is, is what gives us that knowledge, the true Hakikati knowledge. So as I'm thinking about all this, today it suddenly hit me in, in a different way, that when it says the doors to Jannat are opened, and we know Jannat is the level of the intellect and the light of the intellect and knowledge. So when it says that the, with the commencement of Ramadan, means with the establishment of the Asas, and not just the establishment, but you could say even when, when a Mormon get to that place in his learning when they understand what the rank of the Asas is, the function of the Imam as the Asas to give the Tawil. For them, Ramadan has started in the true sense. And with the true Ramadan starting, the doors to Jannat are open because now they start to receive that Tawili knowledge that is the function of the Asas. And if the doors to Jannat are open, the Hadith says the doors to hell are closed, obviously because now ignorance is now going to be shut down when you have the knowledge coming in to uh, remove all ignorance. In that sense, the doors to hell are closed. And in that sense, shaitan gets locked in the chains, practically speaking, because with the true knowledge, shaitan is being locked up during that whole process. You know, so this is one very interesting thing I was thinking. And even if you think it on, on a physical sense of Ramadan, when we fast, even with the symbolic, you know, gestures of closing your mouth, let's say, and not engaging, we're abstaining from things. That's in another sense, we can say that's closing the doors Right, the doors to hell, in a sense, because um, Nasir Din Tusi mentions this, how all the faculties, when they're not um, in alignment with the intellect, or when the faculties, your, everything you do with your organs, your body, is not uh, submitted to the command of the imam, those become, those very faculties become the gates of hell for you, because everything you're doing wrong with your faculties. And <clears throat> uh, alternatively, when you're actually submitted to the intellect, all those same faculties plus your intellect together become the eight gates of paradise. So when the Hadith says that the doors to Jannat are opened, it would mean that when you're using all of your body correctly, when you're always in a state of fasting, which what our Tariqa has, we have many, many examples from, you know, Pir Pandit Juan Murthy, Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah, Imam Alauddin Muhammad has a great firman actually where he says the same thing that in this Jamaat, we keep all of our organs, not just uh, external, but internal, always closed in the sense of not doing anything which is not uh, permitted by the true command of the imam. So there again, we have this idea that the doors of hell are closed when you're, when you're in state of fasting. So if the doors are closed and the doors of Jannah are open. So, you know, there's, there's a lot we can do, but I'll, I'll end it there because there's, I see some questions are coming in. I don't want to take too much time, but thank you. Uh, I, I, I absolutely love when I get a new realization of something I didn't realize before, even though I've seen it before. So thank you for that.
very appropriate and uh, interesting uh, explanation, Khayal. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, let's see. There is a question. Why is Qiyamat hidden along with Hazrat Qayyam, especially when knowledge of everything is opened during Qiyamat? Okay. Um, I think uh, uh, that hadith which says that Allah has created his religion uh, on the pattern of, the, uh, of his creation. So in creation, uh, the most precious thing is always hidden. Uh, for example, rubies are hidden. Uh, the kernel of a fruit is hidden. Uh, I mean, it takes time. Although the very uh, reason of a tree is fruit itself, but by the time the fruit comes again, uh, the essence, uh, the uh, seed is hidden. So this is, uh, uh, even in Quran, the, uh, the Qiyamat and the other topics are hidden uh, for people to, to do a personal search, I would say. And that comes with a good ibadat, that comes with a commitment, that comes with reflection on what we have already read from the available esoteric Ismaili literature. So I think this is uh, one of the phenomena of nature and Allah has uh, created his religion on the pattern of his creation, uh, which is nature and uh, through that natural process. And I think it is for us to reflect and uh, that's where the phrase Imam used for personal search. Uh, this becomes very important because uh, it's a very much a personal search through which a person will be able to uh, understand the secrets of time. And like uh, the valuable things are not uh, kept scattered. Uh, the, they are always hidden. They are always locked. So that's where this particular thing is always locked. And in the beginning, um, uh, a particular mind frame has to be, uh, a mold has to be made. Uh, and from the Zahir, Towards the Batin, a person moves gradually. And uh, in Ismaili history, we see that Tawil came over the time. The Tawil uh, in the time of Fatimi, the Tawil in the time of Alumoth, uh, the Tawils we have now, we can see a gradual progression in that. So I think this is according to the law of nature, and this is for personal search and personal reflection. Uh, Khayal, if you want to add something to that, please. I think you you covered that question. Um, we can probably move on to another one. There's a lot of questions coming in. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, the next question is: Is Taid only available to certain personalities or to everyone? Is there special Taid for certain personalities? Okay. Uh, like Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah has said in an open farman that you can become like Pir Sadardin, you can become like uh, uh, Nasir of Asro, uh, you can become like ahl -Bet. So I think these uh, ranks cannot be achieved without Taid. He has said them openly in his Parman. Uh, and he, he did not mean that, that they will be only available for special people. So yes, one conclusion is it is available for everybody. Uh, with certain, um, I mean, as I uh, just implied that you have to fulfill certain conditions. And after that, you, you are, uh, you in a way have reached to a particular moment, a uh, particular stage where you can receive that guidance. Uh, it is uh, as good as to say that you are receiving Ruhe Qudus, that, uh, uh, um, uh, that pure soul of Imam, you, you are receiving that, which is source of your life. So it is in a way open for everybody, but uh, according to the program of uh, uh, um, of Hazrat Ekhaim himself, I mean there were times when it were it was given to a special people, uh, uh, but uh, uh, principally it is open for everybody. And you know when we do a good ibadat, we get a good thought. If we are reading a farman uh, today after ibadat, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, we understood it in a limited way. If we read it tomorrow again with a with a successful ibadat, we will we will definitely see another aspect shining out from there. You know, uh, we could see some other interpretation which we had not thought earlier. So uh, this is taid, this is uh, divine help, 
which comes through, uh, I mean, in a way it comes through effort, struggle, uh, purity, working uh, constantly, and uh, perhaps it always has an element of rehmat, I would say. So principally, yes, it is open for everybody uh, from what uh, uh, the Farman of Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah says. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll also add a comment to this one, which is uh, one of my favorite comments I add uh, to almost every session, so people might be tired of hearing it. But with respect to is it available for everyone, I think, you know, when, when we study our, our Ismaili text, we'll see that, um, of course, the ranks are there, but it's not a limitation of, like, if you're a certain family from a certain clan that you will get uh, admission into the Hudud e Deen. It was based we can call it on spiritual meritocracy at the time, that those are able to rise, just like those who were not even born Ismaili were able to go from the very lowest rank up to the highest of the being the hujjad, uh, being a hujjad or a bab even. And what's interesting is most of those texts will say that the ta'id normally comes to a natik, will come to the, ima, the asas, the imam, and that it will stop with the hujjad, meaning the hujjad is the one who receives ta'id. After the hujjad, the, uh, the, hujjad, the lower ranking dies, would receive the talim basically from the hujjah to the speech. Now, does that mean that no one can receive ta'id? Ta'id, like soul and ru, is all one. So there's always going to be like this, uh, it's, a, it's a continuation, right, that you can receive, but the higher you receive, the higher you're able to ascend in your knowledge and your ibadat and your purification, the better that it will reflect on the mirror of your heart. So the ta'id is always available. But as you're rising higher in the ranks, you're able to reflect it better or receive it fully so that you can be able to make use of that ta'id, you know, that, that will allow you to um, understand the uh, ambiguities of knowledge and the questions and have the full recognition. Now, what's really fascinating is that in the Wajidin, there's a section where uh, Bernasa Crusoe says that during the time of Qiyamah, specifically during the time of the, of where the Qiyam does his work as the Qiyamah, which by indications will be our time today, that um, the believers will receive benefit directly from the five spiritual hadud, which he meant the aklikul, the nafsikul, the jad, the fat, and the khayal. These are the hadud of the spiritual world, that the believers will receive a benefit directly from them, rather than saying that they will go, like, you know, meaning that you've received the talim from the hujjah or the imam. That's always going to be there. But it's very fascinating to see how often they said that the ta'id only descends up to the rank of hujjah. But then during the time of Qiyamah, the believers start to receive this ta'id directly for themselves. And if we just uh, kind of correlate that to the stuff that we see going on today, the events are happening today, uh, we've just had, you know, a few years back with the Diamond Jubilee, we've seen how much of the ismiyazm that the Imam has bestowed upon the Jamaat. You know, there were years and years where people were saying that when is, when is the Jamaat going to get ismiyazm? You know, there was, a, there was actually a big, uh, big time when there was not any ismiyazm being given. And from let's say 2011, there was of course some, and then throughout the, uh, the diamond, the diamond jubilee, and that to me is related to that, especially since Imam made us all his dies, indicating to us that progress is open now, right? There's a full admission. You're able to progress very quickly in today's time, along with what you had mentioned, Alwaiza, that in today's time there's the communication, the the level of uh, you know with social media and internet, there's so much ability to communicate amongst everybody and find any knowledge you want and share knowledge. So that's my only, I wanted to add about is Tayyid available for everybody. This is definitely a very blessed time we're living in. So the next, yeah. Yeah, the next question is similar to the previous one. It's just there's a, a comment you might want to add on this because the question is, can anyone other than the 313 Momin, Mominins attain those ranks? Or is it for just 313 Mominins at a time? Now, this is similar to the previous question that is it just mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. moments? But I think you might want to address this idea of that. Is it, you know, if we accept this idea of 313 Mominin, does that mean there's only 313 people or there's at least, right, when Imam says that there has to be 313 Mominin, does that not mean that, you know, if there's 313, then, you know, the 314th person has to wait until, you know, someone passes to be able to rise to the knowledge? That, would that be the case or is it just that there's, you could say there's always at least 313? Yeah, I think um, 313 moments, um, I mean, as uh, Maulana Sultan Mamasha has indicated, so they are always there with the level of knowledge. Uh, but that does, not, that does not mean that there is a cap put there and uh, nobody, can in, no, nobody could be included in them. I think it's a spiritual matter. Uh, there could be many moments uh, who could be merged with those moments 
uh, those representative 313 souls and they could still be uh, working uh, as those 313 moments. So um, uh, I, I think spiritual counting could be very different from what uh, physically we count. So uh, there are there, there could be souls because souls could travel faster than the bodies, and uh, uh, it is um, uh, it, it is quite possible that in one moment uh, the progressing other moments get annihilated and they work to their souls work together. Perhaps because in many in many respects they would perhaps themselves would not even know that uh, they are selected souls or from amongst the 13. But uh, uh, it is quite possible that some other souls which are progressing and getting higher, they could uh, annihilate into those souls. Uh, like um, I think uh, the, the, the story of four birds. So it says that, that, that the four birds were four widgets and they carried uh, the particles of the people of the whole world. And those particles were released from those uh, widgets only. So it could be that the if there are people, 313 people uh, of different ranks, so the higher ranks people could annihilate the other people progressing and uh, the counting uh, counting remains same. For example, like when we say Panchtanipak, we refer to Prophet Muhammad, Mawla Murtaza Ali, Bibi Fatima to Zahra, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain only. Now Salman Farsi was included, but we never said Chetan. We always said Panjitan. Even at that particular time, although Prophet said that Salman is from, um, from us, ahl he also said that Salman is a gate of Jannah. But we never said Chetan uh, because there might be some other uh, companions of Prophet who have, might have reached there. Uh, they get annihilated in those representative souls and they're still known as five tan. So from there, I, I conclude that uh, there could be more than 313, but they could be annihilated into uh, those ranks and still be at that, uh, still be achieving that uh, status. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So the next question is a, there's two parts to the question. The first part is asking just for confirmation to that, is this the Dore Kiyama? And then uh, the second question is that has your mom spoke highly of Mawlana Sultan Muhammad Shah by saying that he was the finest Imam? The next Imam may say something similar about Mawlana Hazri Imam, who has also accomplished a lot. So then why is Mawlana Sultan Muhammad Shah, who was an Imam like all Imams, why is he considered the Imam? Because Hazrat Ram is also the Imam. So why is Mawlana Sultan Muhammad Shah given more importance? Um, okay. As you said, that <laughs> Sultan Muhammad Shah was the Hujat Ekayim. Yeah. I think um, it is not only the firma, the remarks of Mawlana Hazrat Imam. There are certain other indications also, uh, which brought us to this particular conclusion. And having said that the ranks of all Imam is actually one, it is uh, as per their role and the time that make is different or significant. And Maulana Hazri Imam is the Imam of Dauri Qiyamat, uh, the cycle of Qiyamat. Uh, in one of the Ginan Salama Sahib says uh, a poem, uh, there is a mankabat of Maulana, uh, for Maulana Hazri Imam. He says, Imam Dauri Qiyamat, Imam Ali Muhammad. That now these imam have an additional role that they are imams of the cycle of Qiyamat. And uh, the mission of the Hujat of Qaim and Hazrat Qaim al Qiyamat will be carried out through them. So, in that case, it makes them special, anyways, because now they will be carrying out this uh, particular, uh, whatever prophecies of this uh, uh, cycle uh, have been uh, done, have been said will be fulfilled by their work. And we could see that already in Imam's work, pluralism, working for humanity, bringing changes. So uh, I think uh, the Imam will be a very special Imam also. But I think not one, but many other uh, sources indicated towards the time of uh, Hujjat Qaim, And that is the personality of Hazrat Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah. And saying that, that he was the finest Imam, it not in any way to say that uh, any other Imam was less than him in his Noor enlightenment, uh, in his spiritual status. It is uh, the announcement and the beginning uh, in that particular respect, the uh, personality of Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah. Uh, comes uh, in focus. And the Farman of Rohani Qiyamat, which uh, Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah has made, 
the hope of spiritual um, uh, elevation which he has given. He has talked about uh, uh, the ibadat or of independence. Tum azadi ki ibadat karna siko. I mean, penetrating thoughts. There was a revolution in thoughts and in uh, concepts also. So these all indications uh, tell us that he was the hujjat of time. And as our dais have also concluded that it will be in this particular era. Uh, yes, Malana Imam will carry on this mission. So he will. He is going to be a special imam of Dore Qiyamat and all imams after them will be like that. Okay, thank you. So the next question is um, more specifically related to the night of Layl Tul Qadr. So the question mm -hmm. is about the tasbihs which are recited in Jamaat Khana on the night of Layl Tul Qadr. What is the significance of those tasbihs? Is there an esoteric interpretation of those tasbihs which we should be aware of while we are reciting them? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, of course, the special tasbihs and uh, those tasbihs, in fact, all tasbihs have a direction towards the tawil. For example, uh, when we say, Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad, in our daily dua, uh, if we say it without thinking about what Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad represent and uh, what is the significance of it saying. Uh, ya Ali, because Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said that Ali and I are parents of this Ummah. So when we are saying Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad, we are actually saying, oh, uh, oh the spiritual mother, oh spiritual father. And a child calling mother and father for nourishment, for support, for safety, for protection. So while we are doing this tasbih, this also has a very deeper meaning. I'm just giving an example. So uh, principally, all tasbihs uh, are directing us towards that particular uh, destination only. Uh, but the tasbihs like Ya Ali Atrikni, Ya Ali Atisni, uh, it, it is uh, we are asking for help. And uh, it means that, oh, Ali, find us. Atrikni, find us. We are lost. Find us like a child is lost uh, in a big uh, circus somewhere. So you find us. We can't help ourselves. You find us like a mother who will keep an eye uh, and remain very alert that his child is, uh, uh, her child is not lost in a crowd. So these tasbihs are also important in that particular manner. Uh, uh, and there are many more tasbihs, you know, which have, uh, deeper meaning, special meaning. Uh, as we said, that there are tasbihs um, uh, we generally take out. There are special tasbihs. There are Qurani tasbihs. For example, the prayer of Hazrat Yunus, the prayer of Hazrat Adam, uh, the prayer of Hazrat Nu. So the, these all tasbihs lead us to that uh, particular uh, core of spiritual progress or the prayer and humility uh, it, it has. Uh, but representative tasbihs could be given and they, they could be changed by Imam sometimes, you know. So, yeah, they have some special meaning and uh, we should think about it uh, that they are uh, these that we have to appeal that, oh, Ali, find us. We are lost. Oh, Ali, help us. Uh, oh, Ali, uh, you are Rahim, you are Rahman. And you, I mean, have mercy upon us. It is in physical sense, but more than that, have mercy on our soul, have mercy on our intellect, which is blind, which is uh, crippled. Uh, so if uh, while doing any tasbih, we also have an idea of getting help in our spiritual and intellectual life, then that tasbih uh, gets more meaningful. Then uh, the impact of that tasbih uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, it, it has a greater impact on us and it is also accepted. For example, when we say Ya Wahab in morning dua, it says that, oh, uh, the, I mean, you are giving people in abundance. Uh, but that is not only limited to our physical life. We should be thinking about spiritual life and intellectual life, that you are the one who can give us a lot of things to progress in our spiritual life and also in our intellectual life. So these are representative tasbihs. Uh, uh, we should uh, apply to our spiritual and intellectual uh, progress and uh, many other tasbihs uh, uh, direct us to the same uh, destination in fact here. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's a question about the terminology of he who is above all else. So can you explain more about he who is above all else? Does this refer to the Nure Mujarad or to the recognition of the Nure Mujassam as being a manifestation of Nure Mujarad? Or is this something else? Okay. Um, when Imam or Prophet in, 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 is in a body, uh, we know that it is not uh, all that uh, that the, the, the nur he contains, uh, the reality he has is all cannot be seen just in his body. So uh, he is much more than uh, his body, uh, which we see. So I think our, uh, uh, our Buzurgs have uh, given us a scheme that you should know Isme Imam, Jisme Imam, Imamate Imam and Uluhiyate Imam. That you should know his name, his body, his personality, uh, the secrets of his imamat and the secrets uh, uh, and the divine secrets he has. So, uh, they, I mean, because Nure Mujassam is in form of a body, but that reality, uh, the whole reality is not just covered in that body. So there is definitely beyond that body. So perhaps we can say it Nure Mujarat, which comes in Nure Mujassam. Uh, where we could have, so that we can contact, so that we can relate, so that we can love, uh, to be able to understand the, the stage of nur e mujarrat or the higher stages of recognition of Imam. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to scan here to find, okay, so there's a question about, um, we we're speaking about the cycles of Kiyama. Let me just quickly find that one. Okay, so does Kiamat go in parallel with the next time, meaning the time of a new Adam? If this is true, can you explain more about it? <clears throat> the indications of Vajhedin uh, do suggest that it goes parallel with the time of uh, next Adam. But uh, these all are realities uh, to be discerned by Ainul Yaqeen. So uh, I think uh, we need to uh, reflect more and pray more to understand the reality in detail. But definitely there are indications that uh, this is a parallel time of the next Adam. But on the other hand, this is also said that uh, the results of Qiyamat will be seen in thousands of years. So this, this makes it difficult to understand it fully. So I think uh, this perhaps needs uh, more penetration in our literature and also asking for help to understand uh, these secrets more and more. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, so there is a question um, that was related to what you had mentioned in your session about UFOs. So mm -hmm. can you uh, explain more about the UFOs helping us to go to other planets? Also, is it happening now that people are getting in contact with UFOs? Um, okay. Um, since it is quoted uh, by Alama Sahib in this particular book, this book is Qurani Mina, and then it, there is another book uh, uh, which is about spiritual science. I will remember its name. It's a small booklet. So wonders and marvels of spiritual science. I think that's what it is uh, known as. So in that particular book, he also has come up with these kinds of prophecies. And uh, his knowledge definitely witnesses that uh, he has gone through a spiritual revolution to be able to come up with uh, that deeper tawil, connecting it with the previous tawils or adding up to the previous tawils. So that's where his prophecies uh, are significant uh, uh, in my eyes. Uh, but to explain it further, yes, I can try because what he says that uh, the developed souls live on the other planets because they don't need, uh, they, they, they are in their astral bodies, which does not need food, air, oxygen. They does not have blood. Uh, they don't have diseases. That body is like uh, sunlight, uh, rays of sun. And those developed souls uh, may come because Pinasira Kusura also says that every planet has its own soul. So even uh, a planet is not without a soul, without a life. 
uh, no planet is completely a vacuum. I mean, what scientists call a vacuum is not vacuum uh, according to spiritual interpretation. Uh, there is a uh, spiritual existence is there. There's spiritual life there. So that's where, according to uh, Allah Manasi Runzai, from where most of it I have understood that these bodies are there and uh, the people, what people see uh, in the name of UFO, unidentified, any science despite all its claims have not been able to understand uh, what this particular reality is. And that's where they call it unidentified. And there are many, uh, uh, many occasions reported, in fact, uh, at army bases, uh, uh, at different other places that UFOs were uh, seen. And uh, even if we search Google, many people talk about it. So people are already, people have already started to experience, but perhaps that particular point has not come where anybody might be taken in his physical body to go to that planet. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if they will just take our soul or once a planet is uh, able to have a human being there, uh, with oxygen and other conditions of, uh, conditions of life, or will they be taking us then? I'm not sure. But that's what he uh, he predicts, that uh, they will come closer to human beings and they will come to help them. And uh, the human beings will get refined slowly. Their hearts will get transparent and they will get transparent to the extent that if they think bad about some people, that person would know that he is thinking bad about me. And this person will also know that the other person knows I'm thinking bad about him. So transparency, purity will come and that subtlety of human beings uh, will be manifested. Um, so yes, I mean, he says they are developed souls. They are living on other planets. We perhaps think that uh, nothing exists there, but spiritual life exists everywhere. And they can come and help. They can come in different forms. As we see that people see them in form of a saucer or sometimes they see them in form of lights. So the spiritual life, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that is talked about even in Quran. Um, so the spiritual life exists everywhere. And uh, the uh, developed souls, the concept of developed souls or angels is also there. So, uh, yes, but how this actually will uh, be unveiling itself, uh, I'm really not very sure about it because this is a topic of uh, Ainul Yaqeen and perhaps uh, the time to come will be, uh, will be telling us the actual reality. But at least uh, uh, the reality which people are calling UFOs, uh, we people of faith uh, need to understand that uh, these are developed souls or miracles of Mola, which are appearing because there is one prophecy in the Quran which says, uh, uh, We will soon show them our signs in this cosmos and also in their own souls so that they know that their Lord is uh, the truth. So perhaps... Uh, these signs are shown to people out there first to change the world because it, it, uh, it seems that the souls and angels which have descended will change this particular era. They will make this particular era a blessed era, a knowledge era, uh, a spiritual era. So uh, these all things will perhaps help. And the prediction is there that Allah is going to show us some signs in this universe. Uh, the Zahiri people write, uh, the people who only believe in Zahir, they write that uh, Allah has shown us the sun and he has shown us the moon. But these signs existed while uh, revelation was uh, uh, there for Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Allah cannot talk about those, those, uh, those signs. There are some other special signs that he is talking about, which will be shown. So that's how I would like to answer the question, Khayal. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question about the veils of Qadr being better than a thousand months. So you, mm -hmm. you, may, you did explain uh, some of the ta'wil about the particular imam being the Hujjat al-Qayyam. 
But uh, what is the significance of the word, like the number thousand? Why would it say a thousand? Why did the prophet, or why did the Quran say a thousand months? Okay. <clears throat> um, as I said, this could mean uh, all the imams till the time of Adam. Uh, we do have a counting of imams in some of our uh, literature books. It could be that uh, some imams, because there were imama ne mustaqar and imama ne mustawda, uh, we have heard these terms. So it could be that some imams were known and other imams uh, were there who were not known. Uh, and this counting is for this period from Adam to Khatam and at, up to this time. Uh, it could be that it crosses the border of this cycle and goes beyond that the Hujat of Qaim appears uh, as after 1000 Imam. I mean, that particular knowledge has not been disclosed till 1000 Imams have passed. So uh, th this could be, uh, this counting could be uh, of the personalities of Imam in one way. And sometimes uh, when you say thousand, you perhaps mean thousands of. Hazar martaba kaha hai. I mean, we say in Urdu, they have told you thousand times. So I don't know if it means more than that or many previous imams or exactly uh, counting the personality of 1000 imam. It could be both perhaps uh, because the dua which I said, I have heard that it is said that uh, in the name of 1001 names, except our prayers, you know. So they could be one 1,001 jamas of imamat. Uh, they, they, they could be all previous jamas of imamat because this is for one particular time that these uh, secrets were not revealed uh, till a long period. And that long period, uh, uh, it is a physical counting of 1,000 imams or it is a symbolical counting. I, I, I'm not very sure. Or does it cross the boundary beyond Azrat Adam or just it starts from Azrat Adam? This is also very difficult to discern because the names of Imams which have been reported uh, in book uh, Al-Imama Fil Islam and in other books uh, are definitely not 1000, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So if I may add to that, um, you know, interestingly, I found this information in um Maybe some people are familiar that uh, Alawai Shiraz Kabani had written a book called Ismaili Festivals, The Stories of Celebration. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's not that, there won't be like Batin or Tawili information um, in terms of like the Ismaili Hakaik in there, but it, it goes over some of the, um, the aspects of the, the way that these festivals are celebrated, the way we observe certain festivals and the traditions which are associated with them. And there's an interesting um, section there about Lel Tukadr where he always mentions that that there is a tradition in the early sources where the prophet is said to have narrated a story of a man who carried weapons and fought for the sake of God for a thousand months. Those who heard him were astonished. According to the sources of the Asbab al-Nazul, which is the occasions of revelation of when, you know, the Quranic uh, revelations were sent down, what was going on at the time. So in that literature, it was pointed out that in the chapter about Layl al Qadr, it was then that that story, that that chapter was revealed when the prophet was telling the story about a man who crossed the desert for a thousand months. And the prophet then says that this is better than the month in which that man carried his weapons and fought. So what's interesting is that according to this, and again, you know, this could be a true account or you'd have to go look at the literature. Sometimes we have a lot of stuff in the Asbab uh, al-Nazul, which is the occasions of revelation. It could be correct. It may not be correct. But it seems that there was already a pre-existing uh, story or an understanding, perhaps, you know, anecdotal tale at that time that there was a man who was crossing the desert ready to fight for God with his weapon for a thousand months. And when the people were so astonished, then we have Surah Qadr and you have this uh, that this is better than a thousand months. And the prophet was pointing out that this is actually better than that understanding. You guys were so surprised that somebody could cross the desert for physical with his weapons and fighting for a thousand months, but here is something which is even better than that story or better than that example of that man. So, you know, when I read that by itself, it's kind of interesting and maybe put some context of what does that mean to say a thousand months? It must be, it could be something which is already in the understanding of the Arabs at that time, like a, how we have expressions today that only makes sense if you understand the expression. 
But what's more, more interesting to me is that the story of the prophet is that the person was fighting with weapons. He was carrying them for a thousand months with his weapons to fight. And yet, Lil to Kadr is meant to be better than that thousand, that, that fight of a thousand, or, or readiness to fight with weapons. So immediately, I think when we hear terms like fighting and weapons, we should think of jihad. And if we think of jihad, then we should think of the jihad e akbar. So if, if, if it is said that the Hujjat Akayam, who is the, the meaning or the ta'wil of the Lil to Kadr, in that sense, the Hujjat Akayam is also better than that man who was fighting for a thousand months with physical weapons. Why would that be the case? That would only be the case if we relate that to how spiritual jihad or jihad the upper is greater than physically fighting with weapons. And that can go in two ways, of course. It can be individually our personal um, fight against our nafsi mara, which is better than physical fighting. On the other hand, we also have the hadith about how um, Imam Ali will be the one to uh, fight for the ta'wil, to do the battle of the ta'wil. So if you look at this example with uh, Imam the uh, Hujat Akayam, being better than a thousand months of physical fighting, then you also have to understand that we would understand that this battle of Tawil, that the, the greatness of the Tawil will be better than all the other types of forms of fighting, which is, you know, when you fight with knowledge, fight with the pen. So I think this might be an interesting way of looking at that, especially if you link with resurrection, because of course resurrection is linked with the, any, any type of jihad and more so with the spiritual jihad. So perhaps, you know, there are some, there are some hikmat in that story beyond just that physical man who was fighting with weapons, we can take it as understanding that in the power of this night, um, not necessarily the physical night, but when you go through your own little together by engaging in the spiritual jihad, which is better than physical, and when you attain the recognition of the true status of the isas or the hujat akayam, meaning that that is the moment when you will uh, come upon your own resurrection, that that will be that great night that's better than fighting for a thousand years, which is very difficult, or carrying weapons for a thousand years. That was just something I thought interesting to share. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so there is a couple of more questions. Um, mm -hmm. If one cannot attend Jamaat Kana for Leil together, what should one do at home for prayers? Will Chanta be accepted if a friend does Chanta on behalf of the individual who is disabled? Uh, okay, uh, for a disabled person, yeah. Did I hear you correctly? Yeah. So, I mean, will somebody will the chant be accepted for the friend um, on behalf of somebody who is disabled? And also, if one cannot attend Jamaat Kana, what should you do at home for your prayers? Okay. Um, okay. There is a Jamaati protocol um, uh, with the uh, permission of Mukhyanima, for example people uh, sit on chanta part and give chanta and sometimes it is decided by the volunteer captain also yeah at, at some places i have seen so i think for a disabled person uh, with all good niyat and prayer uh, and humility if somebody wants to perform chanta in my eyes uh, that is acceptable because in any case there is no other way for that person to feel uh, satisfied and um, uh, even if you are doing it at home, it is accepted uh, because if you are taking care of a disabled person and can't go to Jamaat Khana, you are far away and you can't go to Jamaat Khana. You have duty hours and you can't go to Jamaat Khana. So I think uh, uh, Mola has always given us a way that you take out your tasbih, you say, Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad, uh, other names of Imams. So uh, in my eyes, it should completely be acceptable. Uh, as you you can try your best if you can attend because it's a jamaati soul that works uh, that helps. But if there are if there are circumstances which are not allowing us, there is no harm doing uh, it at uh, personally at your home and uh, make your home enlightened with your tasbih, zikr, ibadat uh, because Islam is a way of life. Uh, it does not start when we enter Jamaat Khana and does not end when we leave Jamaat Khana. So in any case, we should be doing some extra tasri, ibadat, discussions at home only. So if somebody has a very pressing situation, uh, I think this should be acceptable. Okay, thank you. So next question is about Leil Tukadar being a blessed night. Was it blessed to start off with? Or did it become blessed because of the revelation? Uh, sorry, I missed the first part. Is it blessed because? 
like was it blessed to start off with meaning was it already a blessed night or did it become a blessed night because that was the night of revelation um okay uh, i mean uh, because uh, uh, we 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 are looking at tawil and in tawil it is not the night of revelation in that particular sense uh, it is night uh, for example when the miracle of shab e qadar starts to work in a personal world then that person uh, focuses on bandagi sees the first light goes ahead goes through mutu qabla anta mutu so uh, i think there uh, what particular night uh, he uh, he saw first light may not be that important uh, nur of uh, hujjat e qaim work for him is more important i mean it is night of revelation is a is an exoteric understanding and people think that uh, this is uh, blessed because of that but for us it is blessed because the nur of hazrat qaim was uh, revealed in the personality of hazrat e hujjat e qaim and it is not that one night this is a symbol uh, this is only a symbol that we celebrate and this uh, symbolized ritual prayers and uh, ibadat in jamaat khana may lead us to the deeper understanding and uh, a, a, a habit of doing it every night you know so this particular one night for example we celebrate mothers day fathers day uh, safai day any day uh, okay to highlight the importance uh, it is okay to have it one day but uh, uh, it does not mean that the rest of the days you should not be doing it in that particular way especially after we heard the farman of imam sultan mohammad shah who says that every night at midnight an angel comes and calls that is there anybody who wants his request to be taken to allah or his sins to be forgiven so yeah we could give importance because it's a jamaati prayer it is a, uh, it is a ritual which definitely is going to help us especially with jamaati soul uh, but with the understanding that every night would be equally important if we uh, if we want to do ibadat on that night yeah because it is a symbol and a misal yeah okay thank you so there is a question about something that the imam has said um so we've been, we've been made to understand that the imam has said that i wish my jamaat would recognize me so besides his imamat and him being the highest level of everything what else may we we be missing in recognizing him <clears throat> i think uh, we jamaat have a lot of love for mola um we really want to devote ourselves uh and if we are able to do ibadat also because imam wants us to recognize him we want to recognize him and we should believe that there is a series of spiritual miracles which could take place if not all some for example uh that seeing mola with our inner eyes seeing mola in our didar uh even that is a form of recognition that we could see that how comprehensive uh his uh, didar is how uh, source what what a source of happiness it brings to us and uh, he can be so affectionate uh, in zahir as well as in batin uh, and because he is uh, our spiritual father and mother so our soul needs nourishment like a child needs to sit uh, when a, a particular time has passed from his birth he needs to stand up he needs to walk he needs to use his five senses so this is all we should be thinking about that our soul needs to grow it needs to sit it needs to stand up it it should know how to walk in spiritual world it should be able to use its spiritual eyes uh, its spiritual senses and uh, that's what is missing the knowledge of those uh, uh, stages and the practical effort towards uh, reaching those things so i think our love is there but uh, we also need to know certain conditions of a spiritual progress uh, which i repeatedly say in my lectures that it is also about our ethical life it is also about how we manage our day uh, what we eat what we think what kind of company do we have um, 
uh, and, and knowledge and wisdom and what is our effort towards knowledge and wisdom because this is the uh, this is the most important thing in the recognition of course together with the ibadat and zikr and reflection so and if we we feel we cannot do enough ibadat zikr and uh, uh, focus on ibadat then focus on knowledge uh, but of course, with prayer, that may we be able to digest that knowledge and on the level of knowledge of certainty, uh, which could be attained through sources uh, uh, of Ismaili Da'is and Peers and those who talk about deeper Ismaili Tawil, uh, on that level at least, because one recognition is through knowledge also, that every time a veil is lifted, if we know it better. So, yeah, I think the knowledge of exactly what a moment has to go, what kind of spiritual miracles and stages may come in front of us, how long the journey is supposed to be, how we should be uh, able to um, attain those different stages. Perhaps that knowledge and details of those stages, that is missing from our uh, conscious uh, religious life. Otherwise, we have the passion, we have the love, we sacrifice, uh, we are all there to do things. Uh, but uh, this knowledge perhaps is missing. And uh, th this is what we should uh, try to acquire to recognize him gradually. Uh, and he also lifts his veil one by one. And this could be done through knowledge also. If one finds that, oh, I, despite my best effort, I, I am not able to concentrate while I feel bad about it, while still trying for that, but I can't do it. He should also not give up. He should try to get this recognition through knowledge. And the one who can do ibadat should get it merged with the knowledge to progress. Uh, that's what I could think of, uh, Khayal, if you want to add something. I, I think that was, that was good. Um, I, we can move on to an, the, another question if you have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay, so is the night of Laylatul Qadr significant because the Prophet received Ismail Azam from Allah? And they're referring to uh, Surah Allah about the uh, Ikra, uh, Bi Ismi Rabika. Uh, I think in previous lectures, um, uh, I have explained and I, I had heard uh, the lecture of uh, Dr. Khalil Andani also that the concept of revelation, that it all happened on that one night in Ghari Hira uh, is an exoteric aspect. Uh, for us, the revelation was uh, Batini. Uh, his heart was illuminated. His heart was enlightened with the miracles and uh, uh, the spiritual experiences. And when he started to narrate it, that's where uh, uh, it, that's where it, it, they 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 uh, they were transferred in writing in scripture. So it could be that that particular uh, uh, inspiration happened there and then, but it could just be representation of something which has already taken place in his spiritual life. So uh, I think more important for us is the day for us or where the spiritual light could be witnessed or the realization or recognition uh, of, this, uh, of these different stages of spiritual progress uh, is done. I mean, on the face of it, fine. We said this is the first night of revelation. But as we know, the nature of revelation is such that uh, uh, the heart of prophet was already uh, in your mind. Alam nashralaka sadrak that have not expanded your heart. Uh, okay, uh, there was a, there was a gradual journey also. Uh, in one way, if one wants to celebrate that this was the beginning of the revelation, uh, re revelation on the prophet's heart. Uh, in exoteric sense, it is fine, but I think esoterically, if we look at it, uh, the only importance of that night is just not because of. That because that is debatable that the whole Quran did it, uh, the whole Quran did not reveal. But if we want to celebrate the beginning of something, uh, it's fine in its exoteric meaning. But uh, after we have seen all the Batini aspects also, so there should be much more than that to celebrate on that particular night. Uh, if we are getting together for Jamaati rituals, yeah. 
Right. And, and I think um, it's significant to point out, I'm not sure what the background to the question is, because it seems like it's asking if um, the, that was a particular night that the Prophet received this miasm. Mm -hmm. I think from my understanding that the Prophet had already received, you know, already had this miasm, because if the Prophet was engaging in acts of uh, meditation or ibadat prior to the night of, of Qadr, uh, he would not be doing, doing so on his own on his own accord, meaning that would be the imam of his time would give him the ismiyazm. Just like today, we have the similar situation that we'd have the ismiyazm to perform the specific special ibadat. And, you know, I think also it, 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 this goes to the question of um, the ta'wil or understanding Surah Alak and what does it mean where it says to read in the name of your Lord or read through the name or by the name and there's different tables put, you know, that one can find if one, especially if one uses the Q wiki on, on monoreality.org. Um, but, you know, when it says like to read in the name of your Lord, I know one will is that, so the revelation was starting to con uh, commence, let's say, with the prophet. And where all the world itself, you can see, because, you know, Allah writes his signs, not only within the heart internally, but externally. And the external world itself becomes interpreted by the Natik or the ones who can become Natik to be able to... Um, be able to read the universe and give his uh, that becomes a form of revelation by reading the signs of the universe so when it says to read in the name of your lord it actually could be read through the name of your lord what it means is that now look at the universe now look at what i'm showing you but look at it through the power and the light of ismayazam and you'll be able to read and and transform that the, that that the experience into the language into the words which will become the revelation so read what you're seeing or interpret what you're seeing through that power of this miasm, which you already have, to be able to read um, the signs of God, which are externally and internally. So these are, all, I think, perhaps maybe part of the, the question. But it, I mean, I think from our sources, it seems that the prophet was already received this miasm prior to that night. So it wasn't just like that one night. And then I think this also speaks to the question of what exactly is, what are we celebrating that night, right? I think sometimes people might be a little bit wondering that once we've heard all this ta'wil of, let's say, for example, hujjat al-qayyim, and we, you know, we grew up thinking, let's say, that, that we're celebrating the birth of Islam in the night when the Quran was revealed. And where did that put us today? And I think a good way of understanding that in spiritual matters, the, the beginning and the end are together at one. So even if we're talking about the revelation of Quran, if that's what one level of the Del Qadr was, and we consider that the beginning, let's say the beginning of the sixth, sixth day, which is the Prophet's uh, cycle, um, the beginning of the sixth day would also be linked with the end, the end time of that period, which would mean that the whole experience, whether it's the birth of the Quran or it's the understanding the Hujjat al-Qayyam and the matters of the Qiyamat, it was all actually one event, right? So that it, it, for us, it took 1400 years to come, but for the Prophet, there was no time at that moment. These, these experiences are all connected because in spirituality, the time is not like as if he has to wait for something to occur. So I think both are important to understand when we celebrate and what, what it is that we're looking for or what is the, our level of understanding that night that we'll bring to that night? And what is our hope for our future progress? Then perhaps we can understand it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you beautifully explained it. Um, and uh, I like the point that uh, uh, you drew attention of everybody towards uh, monoreality.org, that if you uh, click research, you exactly, you immediately come to QWiki. And uh, if you click QWiki, uh, you can search a word, a verse, um, uh, a key, a term, and you can immediately go uh, into the tawil of uh, Allah Manasir Hunzai's books, which, which could be very helpful. And Khayal is right. Uh, if we understand the tawil of Surah Alaq, then perhaps uh, it gives us much broader spectrum to think about the things uh, rather than uh, taking it as an isolated uh, incident uh, in Garihira. Yeah, thank you, Khayal. And yeah, and I, I've, I've kept the link in the chat as well. Thank um, you. Okay. Do we have time for some more? There's a lot of, uh, I think, questions and comments coming in. I see. Okay. Could we take okay. last two questions, uh, Khayal? Uh, you, you said last question or last two? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Last two, uh, last two oh. questions, perhaps. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's see. Um, what is the difference between Nur of Hujat Qayyam and Hajat Qayyam? As you said that the Nur helps moments during Lail Qadr in personal world. So how do these two Nurs work? 
Okay. Uh, as far as Noor is concerned, uh, Noor is always in a unity. Uh, but since there was a greater cycle was to start and Hazrat Qaim, the cycle of Hazrat Qaim was there and Qaim was to kept in hiding. So he reveals all his powers or he gives the permission to Hujrat Qaim to disclose uh, the higher secrets, uh, some of the uh, tasks which were not done before. Like we see the life of Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah from political point of view, from educational point of view, from social point of view, from Jamaati point of view, institutional uh, point of view, it was a time uh, unmeshed in uh, previous uh, long cycles. So this all was possible because there was a time and uh, the Noor of Hazrat Qaim and Noor of uh, uh, Hujat Qaim, of course, Noor is one. So perhaps it uh, it means that uh, that Noor suppo was supposed to work actively. Uh, there is a term Noor e Fa'al, a Noor which works very actively, a Noor which works very rigorously. So that Noor was supposed to work very actively in that particular time. So actually that Noor is one, Noor e Qaim and Noor e Hujjat e Qaim is one, but the personality of Qaim was hidden in Hujjat e Qaim. Uh, so this all is manifested through Hazrat Hujjat Qaim because Hazrat Qaim was to be kept hidden. So uh, we we cannot perhaps uh, divide and distribute the Noor as such. And yes, uh, and this is the Noor of every Imam also. If today anybody is looking for shab e uh and the secrets of shab e of course, uh, he will find it through the uh, isme azam given to him by Maulana Hazri Imam. And through that, the Noor of Mola, which is annihilated into the Noor of Hujjat -e Qaim and Hazrat -e Qaim, he will get to uh, his destination or he will progress further. So in that particular sense, uh, Noor is one, but that was a particular mission. There was a particular time uh, where the Noor was supposed to work very actively to change the world. And that uh, task happens through Hazrat Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah's personality because uh, 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 all the indications, all the prophecies uh, befit his personality to have done that. And we could see that uh, the spiritual progress in his time uh, in, uh, in form of him giving Ismail Azam to so many people uh, and also the community progress which we saw in this particular time because Qayamat also affects the cosmic effects, you know, the scientific progress, the technological progress because they all uh, owe to that spiritual progress, which is uh, which is hidden, which is behind. Like P. Nasri Khusro gives a very uh, interesting example. He says that uh, if you see uh, a water mill, uh, which uh, uh, grinds the flour, and you, uh, you think that, oh, it is just the stone which is moving on its own. It's not. It is the power of water, which is flowing from the top to make it move. So if you see this world moving, it is not moving automatically. It is the power of nafs kulli which is, which is make it move. So all the uh, other inventions, uh, all the other progress and even unbelievable things which are now happening through science are also because of that spiritual revolution uh, in Batin. So uh, that's where the Noor, uh, the Noor is one. And today, uh, finding the noor e qaim or noor e hujjat e qaim is possible through the isme azam which Malana Hazri Imam has given to us and through the noor of Hazri Imam we could uh, progress or reach to those particular ranks we can recognize them so noor is one in that particular sense yeah okay thank you I let me see here um Okay, there is a question. Uh, when we reflect on Hujat e Qayyam and Hazrat Qayyam, are there any tasbis we can recite? Uh, okay. Um, uh, since Alamana Sirunzai has talked a lot about uh, Hujat e Qayyam in his books and also has uh, indicated the personality of Hazrat e Hujat e Qayyam. So, uh, in his circle, one tasbi uh, is recited. Ya Ali, Mola Ali, Sultan Muhammad Shah Ali. Uh, it is uh, just a desire to recognize 
that uh, great rank and reach the marifat of that rank through the nur of Malana Hazriman. So Ya Ali Maula Ali, Sultan Muhammad Shah Ali, uh, that was a tasbi uh, he recited when he was in Jamaat Khana of China. And uh, uh, he, he recited that tasbi with a miracle that the walls and the ceiling of Jamaat Khana started to recite that tasbi with him. So it was a miraculous tasbi uh, in that particular sense. And uh, that is uh, also keep that thought alive that uh, uh, the great time started here and we should be studying his farmans, especially the farman on spiritual progress, uh, to be able to understand that what uh, enlightenment is uh, awaiting us, you know, what is being, uh, we are blessed with so many things that we have not thought about. Like he says that, Murid or Murshid, telephone ke do sire hai. So there is a possibility of talking to Mola spiritually. Uh, when he says the Ismaili Mazab Ruhaniyat ka takht hai, uh, Ismaili faith is the throne of uh, spiritualism. So we are already born on throne. We are kings potentially. Yeah, and we, we need to attend that spiritual, um, uh, spiritual uh, sultanate, that spiritual um, reign and sovereign. But this all will be able after we have understood uh, his position, the two highest ranks of the religion, uh, the possibilities, the blessings available in this particular uh, time. And uh, one of the doors to understand and achieve those things are the Farmans of Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah, which talk about uh, blessings and spiritual blessings and spiritual enlightenment. And the concept of monorealism itself is a detailed concept which gives us so much hope that we are always connected to that reality and we have not come from him broken like a drop of water comes from the cloud. So uh, these all things will help us towards uh, that. And uh, this, uh, this tasbih could also remind us of uh, the personality of Hazrat Hujjat Qaim and believing that it is the same asas, Mawla Ali, uh, because there are indications that that is the asas, Mawla Ali, the nur of uh, Mawla Ali, uh, which appears again or which is there and which is working uh, in its full form actively because there was a time for the nur of asas to work. So, Ya Ali, Mawla Ali, Sultan Muhammad Shah Ali, and Ali here is title of Hazrat Qaim, so it is remembering and Thank you, Alwaiza. Um, with your permission, may I offer a comment on this or this question? Please. I'd like to offer a comment about the question, but also to bring up something you mentioned in one of your slides, which I think is uh, extremely important to call attention for us again. Uh, so in, in terms of a tasbi we could recite, um, you know, I, I might have mentioned this in other sessions as well, but when you look at some of the Quranic commentaries, in fact, there's one that's published by the Institute of Smiley Studies, the anthology work, which has many, many commentaries. Um, there seems to be that from the earliest time, there was Muslim com uh, Quranic commentators who rec recall hadith or event where the Prophet had said that um, Al-Hayul Qayyum is the Ismiyazm, and he gave very clear indications. Now, of course, that meant to be understood more than just the verbal words of Al-Hayul Qayyum. Um, but there is an indication of al Qayyum. And we also have from Tawil, of course, what that al hay and al Qayyum would refer to. And I think we can we can understand what that might refer to. But interestingly enough, that even in, in, I know in the U.S., I'm not sure about all countries, because I've heard the necessary they don't have in all countries, but in U.S. or maybe North America, I mean, U.S. and Canada, on Little Tulkadar, we do actually recite that Ya al Qayyum Ali al Azim Saib al Zaman Ya Hazrimam, Ya Hayul Qayyum Ya Ali al Azim Ya. So al Hayul Qayyum is part of our observance on Layl Qul Qadr, and we're talking about, you know, all this, uh, the Qayyam, Hazrat Qayyam, we're talking about Qiyama, Layl Qul Qadr. So it's interesting to me that that night we do have that particular tasbih, and the fact that we have that in our sources, it says that al Hayul Qayyum refers to Ismiyazm. Now, um, additionally, I think there's a tasbih of al Hayul Qayyum Ali Allah, and when we use this, I think we remember that Part of Sultan Muhammad Shah's uh, firmans was, he was very particular that one should recite, one should say Ali Allah. In fact, if one cannot say Ali Allah, then one should not even recite the dua, drop the whole dua altogether. So 
So when we remember that Hujjah the Qayyam Farman about Ali uh, Allah, um, and we incorporate that with Al Hayl Qayyum Ali Allah, that might be another indication of what we should be reciting. And I like to relate this to one of the sli- one of the Quranic verses you mentioned was um, Surah 41, Ayat 30 to 31. And we should keep in mind the background of Surah Qadr, where it says that on the, or in the night of Qadr, the angels and the spirit descend on that in this night of Lail of Qadr. But in Surah 41, which I've posted in the chat, I'm not sure if it can still be seen, but it says that um, in the case of those who say our Lord is Allah or our Rabb is Allah, and further, they stand straight and steadfast. And the word is istakamu, which I'll come to. So for those who say our Lord is Allah and stand steadfast and straight, the angels descend on them. Fear not nor grieve, but receive glad tidings of the paradise which you are promised. So again, here the connection is that on the together, we say that the angels are descending. And here in this verse, it says the angels will descend on certain people who fulfill this condition of saying our Rabb is Allah. So if the angels are descending, we should understand there's a link between this verse of Surah 41, 30 to 31, and uh, Surah Qadr of 97.4, that this, uh, there's a relationship between these two where it becomes your own personal little together, regardless of what night it's going to come on. When that event happens, that is like your night of power. And the connection here with resurrection is because when it says that those who say our Rabb is Allah, and then furthermore, they stand straight and steadfast on that, is stakamu, is stakamu is the same word, I mean, has the same root meaning as kaya, uh, as a kiyama. So for those who actually undergo their kiyama, the angels will descend upon them. And another understanding that what does it mean by standing upright and straight is because we can say Ali Allah we, if we want to, but do we really believe? And do we believe that all throughout our life? Maybe at one point we will leave and later on we're influenced by another teaching that says we should not say things like that or not believe in things like that. But those who remain firm in their belief for them, they will experience their kiyama because they were steadfast in that knowledge. They go through the process that is takamu of having the resurrection of kiyama, and then the angels descend upon them. And when it says our those who say our Lord is Allah, that itself is interesting. What does it mean to say those who say our Lord? Does that mean that those who simply say our Rabb is Allah, our Rabb is Allah? I mean, it sounds very obvious to say that that Rabb is Allah. I mean, the nourisher, the sustainer is Allah. That should not be very difficult. So what does it particularly mean? Those who say our Rub, our sustainer who nourishes our intellect, who gives us all the knowledge we need, who gives us the ta'wil that we're looking for, that Rub, that Rub is Allah. And I think my point has been made when I say that, what does it mean to say our Lord is Allah and to truly believe that, to understand the resurrection and have the angels descend so we have our own personal little together night. I think that was uh, my, I just have had to recap the point of the, the session was probably that was, was found in there. And uh, thank you very much, Khayal, to have brought this up. Um, yeah, this is this was very important indeed. Al Hayul Qayyum. This tasbih refers to Hujjat Qaim and Hazrat Qaim, and this this is a great recitation of uh, the tasbihs of Shabi Qadar also. And Al Hayul Qayyum Ali Allah as the Hujjat Qaim implied that that this is an important tasbih. So uh, this could also be a one very important tasbih to recite, to remember Hujjat Qaim and Hazrat Qaim and receive the barakat. And what you talked about was 41, 30, 31. Yes, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense if somebody just says, my Rabb is Allah, unless he believes that his Rabb in the highest rank of Hujjat Qaim and Hazrat Qaim nourishes his soul and intellect. And uh, that's where istaqamu is that uh, his qiyamat is established and then the angels descend upon him. So it's a beautiful link. And thank you very much for having reminded this Al-Hayyul Qayyum uh, and the Tasbih of Shabi Qadr also. That was a beautiful relationship. Thank you. So I believe that will bring our our question answer and our discussion to a close. I'll give it back to Rose to close out the session. Thank you, Khayal. Thank you, Alwaisa. Khayal, these sessions cannot happen without you. So I'm sure all of us appreciate you greatly. Of course, we appreciate Shana Saiba's time and knowledge. So thank you, both of you. And I don't, people are asking you to, Alwaisa, to do some zikr for Leil Fulkadar, but I know we've been going on since uh, three hours, something like that. I don't know if you have time. Okay, um, I can do a short one. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much.
Okay, just give me a second. 